Yeah, uh, this is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Welcome to Community Matters. Actually, it should be way beyond that. It's not only Community Matters, it's political science matters, it's ecology matters, um, it's coronavirus matters. It all matters, and we've got to get our hands around it. And Lewis Herman's going to help us do that. He's a political science professor and much more at UH uh, East Manoa, West Manoa, East, West Oahu. West Oahu. West Oahu is just, yeah, it's not, it's not Manoa. I want to be clear. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes yeah. we have to get out of Manoa yeah. and go west, young man. You know? yeah. um, so, Lewis, uh, you know, yeah. uh, uh, what, what, is, what is ecology anyway? Uh, well, ecology is the study of the relationship between living systems to one another, living creatures to one another. It's, it's basically how all the, the species on Earth live together, evolve together, and sustain one another. So, but, but, but you don't consider a virus a living creature then? For sure, absolutely. Yeah. And, and viruses evolved along with, with cells. They, they ancient, I mean, there are several theories about the evolution of viruses, but they've been around for at least one and a half billion years. That's billion, not million. And uh, emerged soon after cells, or there even some theories that they emerged with cells. They're sort of partial cells. Okay, well, so so I, I guess that's very important. I mean, what you know, I would like I would like to sort of shape this. This conversation could take six hours, but I would like it, you know, to develop the relationship between uh, coronavirus, the virus, and the ecology, or at least to know where it fits in the ecology, in well, the evolution of the ecology, in the evolution of uh, humankind. Yeah. So this is really a mouthful. Uh, why don't Why don't we give you a few minutes to go through your slides because I know. I know you need you need to do that. It's okay to do that. You get you get you get some time from that for that, Lewis. Um, yeah. So why don't we start with slide one and 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 see if you can go through them quickly? Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I mean, a picture can just you know communicate a lot of big ideas very quickly, and uh, it's very obviously graphic speaks a thousand words. Cool. So that that first picture, I don't know if you can have it uh, bigger here. Um, you know, basically talking about the proximate cause of these pandemics is our style of uh, industrial agriculture, in particular CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, which uh, crowd immense numbers of animals together under very stressed, unhygienic conditions, pump them full of antibiotics uh, and manage to keep them alive long enough to produce a lot of meat. Uh, this is done in close association with dense human populations. Generally, both populations are stressed, and it's a perfect breeding ground. It's like uh, the Silicon Valley for incubating pandemics, incubating infectious diseases. And the evidence is that about 60 to 76 percent of recent, this recent rise in infectious diseases is due to this kind of farming, is due to our modern system of Industrial, industrialized monoculture. So, so uh, modern farming, and by the way, there's a great piece on PBS Frontline about modern farming, about the guy who made scientific farming and brought it to the whole world in order to start, stave off starvation. And then he found that, 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 that the modern farming and all these crops and foods were creating you know, overpopulation. And then we wound up with the same kind of starvation that he was trying to prevent in the first place. It's very right. interesting. Um, well, yeah, the food system is anyway, basically broken. Yeah, so, right. So when you move from hunter-gatherer and you, you get into scientific agriculture and you get into cities and crowds and, you know, compressed humanity, um, you, you, get a, you get a really bad thing. It's much worse than life in the good old days as hunter-gatherers. Exactly. But it, it, it follows, you know, because the, it's the search by mankind all these years, 100,000 years has been trying to live live in a, you know, a quality of life world, have all the science and technology and food all around us. As soon as we do that, we get in trouble. So it's a, you know, it's a self-defeating process. How could we not have gotten into agriculture? How could we not have gotten into technology and compressed cities? We had to do that, didn't we? It's our destiny, isn't it? Uh, it's our, I think it's our destiny to, to grow in consciousness and awareness of what we are and what our place on the planet is, but they're pathologies of civilization. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating subject why we moved into civilization, settled cities uh, around 10,000 years ago with the Neolithic Revolution. And the evidence suggests that this was not an 
a happy choice because we wanted to improve our lives. We are forced by desperate necessity, in part climate change, the drying of North Africa, the extinction of the big animals, the big charismatic megafauna, and uh, human beings were effectively starved into agriculture. And with the rise of civilization, you begin to get these infectious diseases and all, all sorts of other pathologies, which intensify about 5,000 years ago with uh, classic civilizations, where you have these mass human populations under generally very unsanitary conditions, often living very close to their own sewage, uh, and the beginning of domestication. Well, domestication begins with the Neolithic, domestication of animals. And so you've got crowds of human populations, not very healthy, living next to in close, regular, intimate contact with animal populations, initially cattle and horses, and then pigs and dogs and ducks and birds and so on. A perfect breeding ground for viruses and other infectious organisms crossing from the animal population, mutating and infecting the human population. Well, so you, you know, there's, there's two ways to go. Uh, one way is uh, we solve the virus problem. We, we bring all our best minds, our, our best biotechnology down on it, and we figure out how to stop the virus, this virus and other viruses that are, you know, uh, pathog pathogenic. Or that's one possibility. And, and then we can live the life that we have been evolving to over the past 100,000 years. Or we can go back to hunter-gatherer. Uh, which, which would you prefer? <laughs> because there's, there's only, or we can stay, you know, static right here, right now, which I don't think works at all. It's obvious yeah. that it doesn't work. Yeah. So we can go this direction or that direction. Which direction yeah. are you advocating? Yeah, yeah. No, we, we, we need a cr creative movement forward. It's not just a choice between this or that hunting gathering or this pathological form of, of civilization. You know, we've got to remember that, that with civilization, you get hierarchy, domination, slavery, and warfare. And that has been a marker of civilization. It's virtually endemic to civilization. But at the same time, you get all the wonderful benefits that you've cataloged, including science and technology, writing, specialized knowledge. And we have the capacity to put it all together and get a better picture on what are the possibilities for human existence where we actually use our technology and our genius to serve needs other than just more food or more wealth, which is currently the plan that we are on. So we're actually following a plan which made a bit of sense in the 17th century when this plan was formulated by the great philosophers of modernity and created industrial civilization. But they weren't playing with a full deck. They had zero knowledge of anthropology. The new world had just been discovered. Uh, their understanding of ecology was abysmal. They were emerging from uh, centuries of holocausts in, with the collapse of medieval Europe. And so, you know, it's time to revise our reality map in the light of this incredible vision that we've been gifted through in part science and the achievements of industrial capitalism. But the old model is dysfunctional. We're going over the edge. There's no getting rid of viruses. We have to reinvent the way we make decisions about how we feed ourselves, how we reproduce. Human population has exploded. We know how to control human population. It's very simple. Educate women give them the possibility of earning their own living so they're not enslaved to men as baby machines. So the, the way forward, I mean, there are a million different points of choice where we can start creating the better world that our hearts know is possible. Well, where, where does the mammalian thing fit? Uh, you and I talked about this. Uh, you know, I, I always feel that you can explain a lot of human conduct by just uh, remembering that uh, we're all mammals. We're all mammals just like the other mammals. And we, right. we're, we are mammalian, um, mammalian uh, animals. And we, and we, we have we, we are hunger, we want sex, we want sleep, we right. want comfort. These, these things drive us. And how right. can you take that out of the equation? I mean, no, you, you have to put all of that aside and go no. to a, a visionary no, no. mode. No, 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 but the visionary mode, that's a great question, Jay, I love that, yeah. The visionary mode is part of the deal. So it's not just feeding ourselves, it's not just reproducing. We are mammals, we primates, we share about 96 to 98% of our genes with, uh, with primates, with higher chimps and so on. Uh, but there was a revolution, there was a leap forward in the evolution of life about 100,000 years ago. When the human emerged, the modern form of the human, between 200 and 100,000 years ago, and what marked the human, what marked the distinction between the human and the primate was our capacity for self-reflection. In other words, it was a form of consciousness that could reflect on itself and could reflect on its own history. 
And this opens up a whole Pandora's box of creative possibilities for the human. And we still haven't quite grasped that as a species. We're still in our adolescence. We don't really know who we are and what we're doing here. And mm -hmm. part of that, the defining- Do we know more than they did 100,000 years ago? You know, I have this vision. Did you ever have this vision, Lewis, where you could, you could go back and talk to yourself talk to an earlier version of you, <laughs> talk to you at say 10 years of age and, yeah. and see what you were made of at 10. Right. And you'd right. find out you didn't know anything. Right. You'd find out right. you were, you know, you really half baked right. on so many things. Right. And it all came later. It all came in the, right. in, you know, in the last 99,000 years, I would be right. really fascinated with a literary yeah. effort at trying to figure out, we should talk about your book, trying well, to figure out yeah. <laughs> what my meeting would be. I, I, I want to have a meeting. Okay. Oh, that, Even that, that's a talk a great... show with yeah. somebody who lived in that period and yeah. i want to find out what he would have to say to me would it be self self introspective would it yeah. be visionary what would he be thinking right. about he had right. he has no base of operation no no fundamental right. you know and would he be just a moron or would he be somebody that would be interesting and i want to get him on the talk show i hope you can help me do that yeah 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 well that's actually been part of my life's work is getting in that in touch with that part of myself because don't forget that when we're all born, we are little primates coming into the strange world. We're not that different from the children of uh, the great ancestors of the sun Bushmen of South Africa 50,000 years ago, 75,000 years ago, essentially the same animal. So we all start off at the same point. We all start off as a little hunter gatherer primed for hunting, gathering and in intimate bands in a pristine wilderness. And I was blessed enough to grow up in South Africa, 60s and 70s, where, well, 60s basically, where the, a lot of the country was still pristine. You could still experience, you could still get a sense of what life must have been like when you had elephants and monkeys as neighbors, when snakes crawled around in the bush, uh, when the, the, the ocean was full of animals. And so when you think of, when you think of hunter gatherer, you're thinking of that, of that that you saw in, in South Africa when you were, right. were a child. Exactly. That, exactly. That's a really, that's a really robust vision of it. Yeah? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and South Africa is, uh, a uh, particularly uh, powerful place to do this because so much of that original ecosystem is intact. It has one of the richest concentrations of bush, mountain, and ocean ecosystem in a small space anywhere in the world. It's one of its uh, biodiversity hotspot on the planet. And plus, plus you've got the remains of uh, human habitation going back 100,000 years in these magnificent rock shelters on the beaches of South Africa, there's something like 3,000 that have been discovered and probably about 30,000 that exist. So it's quite easy to trip back in that and lead that sort of life for a couple of hours a day. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it's beautiful, beautiful. And, and you can see you can see how it's unspoiled and, and humankind did not spoil it. If right. they moved on from place right. to place as hunter gatherer, um, right. they, it would leave it pristine. And then you have then you have the, um, you know, South African cities, which are pretty tumultuous and right. have a lot of people and many, many cities in Africa. I'm thinking right. of Lagos in Africa. It's really overpopulated. Right. Uh, right. They, they and they have, have epidemics right. there. And right. so the, the question, you know, I can take a perfectly good hunter gatherer environment, hunter gatherer ecology, such as the kind that's, you know, you can remember back with a, with a joy of, of, of ref, you know, a, a refreshing view of the world and ruin it. You can ruin right. it. You can right. ruin any place any part of land right. uh, if you make it a, a condensed city. Right? right, right. So, you know, we've got a couple of keys here. Uh, we've, we've got to obviously get a handle on global population. And the way to do that again is through mobilizing this, this mutation that took place in the primate that produced the human brain capable of knowledge and self-reflection because self-reflection gives you choice. And it means that you, you committed to gathering knowledge. The more conscious you are of reality of where you come from, who you are, the, the more options you've got about choosing where to go and what is a life-loving, life-affirming way to go forward. So we've got to mobilize that and deal with human population. We've also got to decentralize because what's driving the center of the movement from land to cities is a form of economics that's driven essentially by a formula that says it's okay to pursue wealth above all else, that the primary moral responsibility of CEOs is to make as much money as possible. You know, this comes, this is the neoliberal formula of the Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman. You know, prime responsibility of business is to make money. You can't run a civilization or a society on that basis. 
and not expect to find massive political corruption that's endemic to the society, coupled with epidemic levels of ignorance. Is so, it sustainable, you know, well, in the world we know? Can it go on for, say, two or 300 years that way? No way. Now, we, we've hit the wall already. You know, we've got all sorts of markers of this with the ecological meltdown. You know, the World um, Economic Forum is estimated by 2050, there'll be more plastic than fish in the oceans. If we kill the oceans, we destroy the climate in a way that's absolutely irreversible. We're on the cusp now of being able to save the biosphere. But we've got, I estimate, 10 years at the max to turn the whole thing around. We need a new formula. Instead of a profit-driven driven free market, we need a wisdom-driven free market. And by wisdom, I mean knowledge of the best way to live. In other words, it's got to be morally driven. It's got to be concerned with an understanding, not just of our own personal lives or our own personal desire to get more for ourselves, which is the current formula generating the epidemic levels of political corruption and ignorance in our society today. But we've got to be driven by concern for finding the, the optimum balance between self-interest and the good of the whole. Because we know that our well-being, this pandemic has made it abundantly clear, is connected to the well-being not only of human beings, but all living systems, the ecology as well. So we've got to turn the formula on its head. Instead of having profit number one, we've got to have wisdom as number one. So what we're talking about really is a cultural revolution, a revolution in values. This is not going to be a top-down sort of institutional demolition job. This has got to be bottom up and it's happening. It's, it's enormously inspiring to see the springing up in all sorts of environments. Well, let me throw one, one at you about that. Like this, uh, this great uh, documentary about agriculture. I forget his name, he was from the Midwest and he invented new ways, the green revolution they called it, right. uh, to right. growing crops all over the world. It was adopted right. all over the world and it feeds you know, enormous numbers of people even now. Um, but, you know, it, uh, it creates too many people, if you can say that. Um, and ultimately, there isn't enough space. There isn't enough planet for them. Whatever right. kind of technology you use on growing crops. Right. And so, you know, the, what, I, what I put to you is that you, there's a tipping point here. You can right. do this. You can do exactly what you're saying. But if you have more than X number of people on Y planet, this right. planet, Right. Uh, they cannot survive. It is not sustainable, and right. many of them will have to die. Arguably, it's the same process we're talking about, except right. it won't be 8 billion. It will be a fraction of 8 billion because right. the planet can't sustain them in the manner that you're describing. Am I right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, well, in the, in the manner that I describe, you know, with sustainable organic agriculture, which is decentralized and localized, people would be living much healthier lives. You'd have the possibility for a more educated, less oppressed population. Uh, you, you detach it from the current model, which is patriarchal, where in the third world, most women are not econ economically independent of their husbands. And so uh, under conditions of poverty, populations are out of control. Wherever women are educated, you have stabilization of, of population. So that's one way to go. The other way is to consider what this current form of, of agriculture is doing to the planet. Uh, it is absolutely unsustainable. It's destroying topsoil every year. I think the amount is about 5 billion tons of topsoil are washed into the Gulf of Mexico and America, and that's just America alone. It's depleting groundwater. About two thirds of all water on planet Earth, fresh water is used for agriculture. Half the rivers in China no longer reach the sea. The United Nations has estimated that by 2030, the demand for fresh water will overshoot supply by 40%. We've already got water wars in Syria and North Africa. So we've hit the wall basically. The, the longer we leave it, we leave it another year, uh, the, the, the more painful the process of transformation is going to be. And we could just tip over the edge. We don't know. There's no certainty in this. We could well, you know, it's like, you, you know, we used to see climate change articles and ecology articles, environment issues and protests and what have you every day in the newspaper. And then came coronavirus, right. which is at the top of the media heap. And we're going to hear about that 24 by 7 every day and right. until somehow it is it is dealt with. And so, I mean, that, that has to be, or at least I can't imagine another way, that has to be number one priority because it's killing people as right. we speak. Obviously. Um, the, so the question is, you know, yeah. ultimately the relationship yeah. between yeah. that virus and, you know, the, the perfectibility of humankind. Right. Uh, okay. how, so, how, yeah. What do we do now to get yeah. there? 
Well, well, you know, clearly we've got to deal with the virus with, with all the tools of medicine and common sense and hygiene that, that we can. We're doing that. You know, it's not just a matter of isolation. Isolation is part of the deal, but many people who get infected don't show symptoms. So immune, the, you, how compromised your immune system is, is a critical factor. What boosts the immune system? How do we create a healthy population? That's part of the equation as well. And then the long-term question is, how do we stop generating infectious diseases and pandemics at such uh, an exponential rate? And the answer there is very, very simple. Our system of agriculture is primarily, is the primary driver for destroying wilderness habitat, that an urban sprawl, and creating these uh, Silicon Valley incubators for infectious diseases. So we've got to deal with that at its source. And there are other really, really good reasons why we should be doing this anyway. It preserves groundwater, it stops soil erosion, it doesn't poison our food, it produces more nutritious food, it puts more people on the land doing satisfying, spiritually satisfying, meaningful, healthy work. Uh, you know, all the indications are people would rush to go back to farming, small scale farming, if it was done in a way that was life enhancing, not uh, the, the slave farms of industrial monoculture. That, what about meat? What about cows? What about chickens? What about that, that is that is the heart of the catastrophe, are the CAFOs, the concentrated animal feeding operations, because in order to keep those animals alive, uh, you need first of all subsidized corn. They fed corn, which is not a, a healthy food for a cow. If in, in the case of beef, uh, they designed to eat grass, not corn. So corn gets them very fat very quickly, but it also ulcerates the liver. They get sick. They suffer bloating. They've got to be given continual low doses of antibiotics. They crowded into conditions where they're standing in their own manure. Uh, they stressed unhealthy animals. It's a breeding ground for, for infectious diseases. And we hospitalize that about 130,000 people a year with things like uh, salmonella, antibiotic resistant E. coli that are generated by these feedlots. So there are actually initi initiatives now in Iowa, for example, I think Cory Booker has just proposed some legislation to, um, to outlaw CAFOs. But of course, you know, the lobby behind this kind of industrial agriculture is running the government. These are immense operations. You've got immense concentrations of power mm -hmm. and wealth behind these operations. Uh, don't so forget, we, we, have, pig, we, have, uh, we have pigs, not, not only beef, we have pigs. Pigs and, and poultry. Yeah. And poultry, and it's poultry. huge. huge. And, and, and that's, that's an inherent, I mean, political science point of view, that's inherent in controlling the decision process of the government. Absolutely. So you really have to, you say revolution, you really have to change that. Those right. lobby groups, those, those capital concentrations cannot be permitted to right. you know, make policy for the government. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's undermining what it has. We, we've seen in, in the political dramas of the last few years, our democracy is withering. I mean, checks and balances are increasingly meaningless. The whole formula of government is losing its, its credibility. So, you know, we, real democracy is what at stake. And real democracy doesn't exist, as Benjamin Franklin no noted. You can't have democracy uh, with too much ignorance, with a population that is not educated. So education, to me, is the driving force in this revolution. It's a revolution of consciousness. It's not a matter of tearing down institutions. It's a matter of waking up individuals. You know, and your work and your show, to me, is part of this whole process of, of transformation. This, this sort of getting the word out, giving a voice to people who are just ordinary folks, you know, college teachers, people working in the community, whatever. Well, we like we certainly like to have people like you on, but uh, I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to uh, uh, block you from talking about your slides. We have oh. a few minutes left, and you okay. have roughly thirty seconds on each slide. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. See what you can do with it. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's talk about the slides. There we go. Okay. So, you know, this is, these are actually bullet points. This was uh, Peter Russell's metaphor for understanding, you know, our place on planet Earth. Uh, the Earth is about 4.6 billion years. So he wanted to give a graphic sense. He wanted to, to try and help people understand what 4.6 billion years is like. So he plotted the history of the Earth and the emergence of humanity against the Twin, the twin Towers of the World Trade Center. And this was, of course, before... 9-11 and they're blown up. And in a way, it was kind of uh, um, darkly prophetic of a crisis in civilization. So if we start at 4.6 billion years, we don't get plants, we don't get the first cells until the 25th floor, the 108 floors of the World Trade Center. 
It's about a quarter mile high. Uh, we don't get uh, plant life until the 50th floor, yeah, which is about halfway up. No plants on Earth until halfway through the life of the Earth. Uh, dinosaurs only appear at the top of that yellow column, the top, not the whole yellow column, yeah, which is the 104th floor. Uh, and mammals don't even appear on Earth until the top story of the 108 floors of the World Trade Center. Homo sapiens appear a quarter of an inch from the ceiling, and the whole of civilization is equivalent to a layer of paint on the ceiling of the top floor <laughs> of the World Trade Center. So, of course, <laughs> you know, <laughs> th th this is a, 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 an exponential growth curve in terms of informational complexity. And then we get this explosion of informational complexity with the humor and the emergence of culture and science and learning and writing and what we're doing now. I mean, the miracles of electronic communication. So this is actually the singularity. The singularity is not technological. The singularity is in consciousness, the capacity to store and uh, comprehend and make decisions on the basis of information. So this, of course, leads us to what would the application of this knowledge and this creativity uh, help us envision for a post-pandemic world, which is really, I guess, you know, the topic for uh, another couple of talks. Or, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid know. it is, but uh, maybe there was something in me that, that yeah. um, you know, let us weave, weave the web there for most of the show. <laughs> I with hope. The, with I the notion, I was, I'm going to trick you into coming back. <laughs> and, sure. and going no, through to. other slides, you know. Yeah, maybe maybe one more slide. There's one slide of how long we've been had together, or so two more slides, I think. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Go. Do we have time yeah. for that. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So you know, the, these are uh, block columns of the time human beings have been on Earth uh, in blocks of uh, twenty thousand years. The left hand column, uh, hunter gatherers emerged about one hundred twenty thousand years ago, probably earlier. But there, most of the evidence is from one hundred twenty thousand years. Uh, Agriculture only emerged 10,000 years ago and didn't really kick off until 5,000 years. That's that middle little blue column. Uh, and then, of course, industrial would actually be invisible on this scale because it's only been around for 500 years and only kicked into high gear in the 19th century. You know, so the question is, what happened? And what happened is, I mean, these historical questions, absolutely fundamental. I think we need another slide. This is what should be essential learning in any high school curriculum it should be can even be brought into elementary school education uh, could you just show one more slide the slide of industrial civilization okay so this is what happened in the 16th century these are the foundations of industrial civilization leading to these exponential growth growth curves in population mobility information energy uh, the bottom axis are centuries the arrow marks 1600 where all this took off and this is basically where you had three revolutions converging, ending feudalism, science, capitalism, and the Protestant Reformation. And this was formulated into um, uh, an operating system, if you like, for human beings on planet Earth, which we call liberalism, classic liberalism. If you study the actual writings of those philosophers, Thomas Hobbes, Machiavelli, John Locke, Adam Smith, founding fathers, and it was a genius achievement under the conditions of the Holocaust of, you know, the collapse of feudalism, but it doesn't work anymore. It's time's run out. It was flimsy in the 17th century. Now it's a formula for global ecocide. Time yeah. to be creative. And maybe you can show up the last one again of the creative slide. <laughs> Do you have that, uh, Eric? The, the, there you go. Yeah, so this is, this is a graphic representation of the sort of creativity that we need you know, just to liberate, because creativity is the last thing to operate in politics. Politics is primarily, as we understand it, corruption, power, self-interest. Yeah. And what we need is, you know, creative expression of what's good for all. Which is freedom. You need freedom, freedom for creativity. One of the fundamental features, freedom and imagination. And there's yes. another one, love of life. We've got to factor that in, love of all of life. We've got to fall in love with the earth again. That's the bottom line. Unless we do that, we're done for because the earth literally, absolutely scientifically, is our mother. The earth literally is the closest face of the creator, which means we're moving into a new earth religion. Well, I mean, we like it or not, uh, the pandemic is going to change us all. It's going to take us to a new place. I, I do want to spend some time with you next show, actually, uh, finding out what that place is like, uh, what it should be, what it might be, and how we, we get there. 
Uh, before we go, though, actually, Lewis, uh, can you talk about your book for a minute and, and how I can find out more about your thinking and your writing? Sure. Yeah, the book's a good place to start because uh, it includes one thread of the book is my story, which is part of the model, uh, the reality map model. Uh, how do we know reality? You've got to know your own head. You've got to know how your, you know, your, your passions, your urges, your emotions have been shaped by your history. And so that's one thread. And you, you'll get the thread really of my um, searching for reliable knowledge about how to be a decent human being, how to live a good life. Um, and I, you know, I stumbled a lot. You know, I grew up in South Africa under apartheid and studied in Cambridge, England, got a science degree, and then volunteered uh, to go and live on a kibbutz in Israel and volunteered for the military and confronted death and you know, all that sort of stuff. That's part of my worldview. The other part is, you know, as the book expands, the big picture, the big story, not only my waking up, but humanity's waking up. So it's the story of humanity from, and the model really, the best model we have of that, that wonderful question you asked at the beginning, which was what it would be like to go back in time and 50,000 years ago and talk to a hunter gatherer. The sun bushmen of South Africa give us the best picture of that life. Until pretty recently, until about the 1970s, there were still groups hunting and gathering in the same environment where their ancestors had for at least the last 30,000 years and probably 100,000 years. Uh, and they're absolutely fascinating in terms of giving us ideas for rethinking politics. And so that the, the book goes through that. It examines the Bushmen, their religion, their way of life, their politics, and then concludes with applications to modern industrial society, where we see signs of this you know, future primal politics emerging. Mm -hmm. So the name of the book is? Future Primal. Future uh, Primal, and where is it available? Uh, it's available online, Amazon, or you can contact me. You know, I'm happy for people to email me or whatever. You know, contact Jay, and he'll give you my contact information. Okay. Uh, okay. There's also we've also um, started an institute um, affiliated to to UH West Oahu called the Institute for a New Political Cosmology, which is really what we're talking about—a new reality map, new worldview. Thanks, well, I, I certainly want to. I want to come back and discuss more. I have a million questions, and you still have a lot of slides, and we can banter them back and forth between us uh, in, in further discussions. But I want to leave you with an image that you have left with me, oh, yeah. and that is, um, you know, they, they have coronavirus in Brazil, and also in Brazil they have uh, primitive tribes, primal mm. primitive tribes, mm. Mm. Um, uh, who live, you know. In, in the deep Amazon and who, um, you know, live the way they have lived for how many tens of thousands of years. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And when confronted with, you know, th the reality of the, the coronavirus, they are really ticked off. They are ticked off that those holly guys, you know, in the Eastern end of Brazil have created this problem or brought this problem to them. And they realize, just as you say, they realized how wonderful it was, um, before that happened, and mm, this is mm, this is mm. undermining their life right. uh, in in the primal you know right. sense, right. Uh, and to see them reacting, to see them right. angry about it, to see them right. trying to hold on to their way of life, right. it's a very interesting contradistinction. Yeah. Anyway, great image. Yeah, yeah, and re recapitulates what happened in the New World, you know, uh, three centuries, four centuries ago, where ninety five percent of Native Americans were wiped out by infectious diseases pandemics, you know, killed most of the population of North and South America. Yeah. Or right here in Hawaii. And so in Hawaii, many, so too. many epidemics here in Hawaii knocked off right. a huge percent of the population. Right. Yeah. Anyway, Lewis, I, I really enjoy these discussions. I wish there was more time. That's the limitation right. of it. But we'll we'll reschedule and we'll we'll find some more time with you and we'll learn so much more. Uh, it'll be kind of like auditing your class or better. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank, much. Thank you, Jay. I really enjoyed it. This is great. I look forward to more. Go well. Hi.